Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune, and we are here to talk about a lot of things. A lot of things Oklahoma football, a lot of things Oklahoma recruiting. I know a lot of people are tapped out on the David Hicks thing, so we'll try to make it pretty quick. We're going to have that, but we'd be burying the lead if we did not talk about him first, honestly. like That would be really stupid on our part because there's going to be a lot of people that aren't on the boards that haven't talked about it or haven't heard our actual opinion that probably missed our YouTube live on Tuesday. So we're going to discuss that first. Um, if you don't know by now, because I, I just had a game, my kid just had a game last night in, in El Reno. And I guarantee you, I had five sets of parents walk up to me that talked to me about David Hicks. Literally. They're like drum drum. Like they see me walking in and they're not just from my son's team they're people that are on the other team or people that know that i was going to be there because my kids are playing and they were waiting to talk like they were excited to get up there and talk about and hear about it and all that type of stuff so there are people out there that still are kind of i guess left in the dark on the whole situation so parker and i will get you through it um, I was down there, Parker, and witnessed it firsthand in its glory. Um, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, to say shocked would be probably the biggest understatement of the world. And let's be honest, like this kid was all Oklahoma till about three fifteen. 310 ish because I was told that it, uh, I talked to somebody that interviewed David afterwards and he hadn't even told the, the A&M staff yet that he was going to A&M that's how fast it flipped think about that he talks to Coach Bates and the OU staff at 310 He walks up there late to get on the podium. We get a few pictures with him. His dad walks over and tells me, hey, man, I'm sorry it's going to be A&M. And I said, are you joking? Because I thought he was just messing with me. Because he was just smiling, like, like just, but he was, like, sweating. And because I said, are you nervous? He's like, no, but it's going to be A&M. So you could tell he was horribly nervous. He didn't want to admit it, but he was nervous. And I said, are you joking? He said, no. Last second decision. I told him before he walked out here, he needed to grab everything and make sure he had the right school and everything like that. I look in his bag and it's A&M and I'm like, dude, What's up? And he's like, oh, well, I'm going to A&M. Just the dad shocked at that point. He's like, okay, we got to call Coach Bates. So at that point, they call Coach Bates, and they let him know. At 2.30 on Wednesday, they are FaceTiming with Oklahoma and showing them the hats and stuff that they're going to use up on the podium. Think about that. I'm thinking. 3.30, he announces he's going to A&M. So within a one-hour span, it all changed. And not even one hour, like a 45-minute span. It all changed. And honestly, a decision like that, would you be shocked, Parker? Would you be shocked if there wasn't buzz about Oklahoma with David Hicks later on down the line? No, it wouldn't shock me. I and I think that's just that's a very like face value, surface level level observation, right? Yeah. Because when everything's been trending one direction for months and months, and that relationship has been there for so long between Hicks and Bates, like, even if you decide at the eleventh hour. I'm going to go to A&M. 
it's hard to mentally convince yourself that that's the spot if that's how yeah. it went down. It mm-hmm. may be easy to get up on the podium and say it's Texas A&M, but coming to terms with and reconciling with the long-term ramifications of that decision, the reality that, hey, this is what I locked myself into, that's harder, undeniably. The When you looked at the photos and the video, did it not look like a family that was like torn? Well, and about what this, was going on. This is what so and I know him. I've have... talked to him since then. Yeah. Well, and they're this... not happy about what I'm sorry, but they're not happy about what the Oklahoma fans have done to him. I've seen screenshots like I, they've sent me screenshots of things that have been in their inbox from people. It's stupid. You all are stupid for doing that. Be mad, but don't sit there and belittle them and call them the things that you all have called them. Fine. If you're going to do it, do it out in the open. Put your name out there. Don't hide behind fake names. Please. Because it's either it's, trolls from other schools or it's actual OU fans being morons. No, and I I promise you the vast majority, Brandon, is OU fans being morons. And obviously, we're not trying to like not you're not trying to paint with too broad a brush with that no. assertion, Brandon, when you say you fans are stupid because mo- here every every rational fan listening to this is hearing those words come out of your mouth and they, they know exactly who you're talking about and they know it doesn't pertain to them. No, right? it doesn't pertain nobody, to, them. It to the nobody people that who go has the their head screwed on straight is taking that personally. But I agree with you and I promise you that there were hundreds. I can promise you there were hundreds of messages doled out to the Hicks or more specifically to DJ in the aftermath had of that to... decision. Because, like, and it's, it, it we, we say all the time, don't tweet at recruits, right? Because that's just not, I, it, it's a Pandora's box. And so I guess in technicality, DMs don't entail tweeting at recruits, but still, if you got a vent by getting in the DMs of a 17-year-old kid and airing all of your grievances, I don't know what to tell you. That's just not a healthy way to process. No. And, and moreover, it here, here's what it does, Brandon. Things like that, instances like that, are the reason why your fan base gets stereotyped. Yep. If you're contributing to that, you're also contributing to all of the broad assertions about the Oklahoma football fan base, about Oklahomans, about Mm -hmm. Sooner Nation. And the unfortunate part is that 95% of OU fans who process that decision in a far healthier manner and were willing to let the kid in Oklahoma go their separate ways. And we're not going to tap out angry tweets or angry DMS or take to social media or YouTube to vent. They get dragged into that stereotype. And so it's, it's it's the 5% that's dragging down the 95%. And that's unfortunate. It it sucks. Like literally before he could get into his DMs, his dad who has access to him had to go through and literally delete. He said hundreds of just scathing messages. And I, I, I told him, I said, dude, they're either trolls or they're not real OU fans because, you know, there's, there's, there are fans that have like five or six accounts and they try to pose as, the opposite fan base of the team that they hate to make them look bad. It's a weird, it's a weird, weird deal. Like I don't even, I don't even, don't think think that gives it justice by saying it's weird, but we're not, we're not, when I say all that, I, I'm not saying like the whole fan base is dumb or stupid or something. I'm saying literally the people that are doing that are stupid. And the sad part is, is the ones that you say are painting a, bad look on the state of Oklahoma, the bad look on the state of the fan base and all that type of stuff. 
they don't care. They don't care. Mainly because they can't rationalize between their emotions and how to act towards people about it. And so they go, like you said, venting on social media. I, I, I suggest a different outlet, like a gym, or like if you're mad about something, go to the gym, <laughs> go for a jog, uh, go hit on a punching bag, do something else besides go and taking it out on a 17 year old kid who quite honestly is being swayed by adults that shouldn't be swaying him at some point. Like that's just like, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not saying he shouldn't go to A&M or anything like that. I'm saying that there are people out there trying to sway him in ways and on both sides, both sides, not just A&M, Oklahoma, both sides that need to stay out of it. It needs to be between the coaches and the players. And I get the whole NIL deal. Great. And if that's what happened, that's what happened. But I can't confirm that. You can't confirm that. You hear rumors, but we know that that's probably a huge stretch. A lot of those, like, the numbers people are throwing out there seem a little ridiculous, right? Like, they just seem absurd. Would you agree with that? They're large numbers. They're large numbers, and I think they're absurd. But that being said, even if that was the case, who could fault the kid? Honestly. So I get it. You can be mad all y'all want. Be mad. Be upset. Be pissed. Just take that anger and put it into something else, not the 17-year-old kid. I know he's the one that made y'all mad. Again, he's seven. Teen years old. And any parent's going to let their kid make that decision. They're going to let their kid, they're going to put their voice in. And I can tell you right now, I know for a fact that the parents were saying, you need to stick with what you were doing, what you had already done. I know that for a fact. But at the end of the day, it was the kid's decision. He's the one living the life. And so that's the decision he made. And we'll see how it pans out. As far as where Oklahoma goes from here, they still have Caden McDonald, four-star defensive lineman that's going to take an official visit for Kansas. They still, and he's one of the top players in the country, they still have Cecilia Connor. I know he's not an interior guy or anything like that. He's an edge, kind of a cheetah-type position guy, but he's still considered an edge guy listed on 24-7, so we'll throw him out there. He's one of the top 60 players in the country. He's going to be taking an official visit during Kansas as well. You still have Marquise Deal if Oklahoma wants to go with that route. And then there's guys like, and he's one of the top 50 players in the country, and one of the top two-way offensive linemen, defensive linemen players. Georgia wants him as a defensive lineman. But then there is guys like, as Parker brought up to me, Avion Carter, family played at Oklahoma, out of Amarillo, committed to TCU. Oklahoma goes down there. They decide they want to take a look at him. If they beat TCU, which we're going to get, talk about that game here in just a minute, okay, maybe they can make a move there because the kid is a legacy. He's a legacy. He is. But if Oklahoma decides not to go that route, they decide not to go that route. Uh, what were some of the other names that you and I brought up? Parker, I'm looking at them right now, I'm trying to look at them at least. Uh, some uh, let's see, some names that we discussed beyond Deal, um, with Johnny Jordan Bowens Hall, right? And yeah, Johnny Bowens. McDonald was. Uh, we discussed Avion Carter. We discussed Ashton Porter, who's a Houston yep. guy currently committed to Northwestern. Anthony maybe James. He gets, maybe he gets a look. Anthony James committed to Washington. Mm -hmm. Although it seems to me that commitment's going to stick. Yeah, um, and then Jordan yeah, Hall, who's uncommitted, and he's he's he actually fits the David Hicks body type. So there's a variety of directions yeah. you can go. Um, it's just yeah, what the the thing you have to keep in mind, the thing you have to understand and reconcile with is that you're not 
replacing DJ Hicks one for one because there is no no one for one replacement for DJ Hicks in this class. I think the way you can do that, and I'm saying this, I'm going to say publicly, is hear through back channels about a guy that is not happy about where he's at. And and he gets in a portal and you hop on it. I'm not naming a name. <laughs> I'm not naming a name. Your face seems that you thought I was going to name a name, <laughs> but I did not name a name. <laughs> so um yeah, I think that would be the other route. And I think if rumor serves us right, I'm gonna be very vague here, Parker. If rumor serves us right, I think this guy would be one for one or at least close to one for one. Would you agree with that? I would. Okay. I would. But rumors are rumors. So until you, until something happens, we're just going to leave it alone. So, but we're going to throw that out there that there is rumors out there about somebody that is not happy at least five games into the season. We'll see how this season, because you don't know how the season is going to play out. Like you yeah. don't know if he's going to get true. playing time down the line. And so we'll see. Um, time to move on. And that's what we're about to do. And we're going to talk about some TCU. Love it. TCU in Oklahoma. I was talking to somebody this past week and I can tell you that Oklahoma has worked on it. And I know that's the first thing you're basically, are they going to tackle better? Are they going to tackle better in this game? That's what they sucked at tackling. We agree. They sucked at tackling against Kansas state. It was awful. It sucked, 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 sucked. But they went live on Tuesday and Wednesday like they've never done before. Like, they go live on Tuesday. It's an install day. Wednesday, they go pretty hard, but they went live, like, worked on straight tackling in open field, like, more than they've ever done. They've they've always been physical in practice, and that's what made this defense really good to start the season. But as the season goes on, you want to kind of lean back a little bit because you don't want your guys getting hurt. Venables... And the defensive staff was like, screw that. We're going to go physical for two straight days. And then on Thursday, we'll loosen up a little bit. Friday, we'll loosen up a little more. And Saturday, you go take care of business. And so they went really hard, I'm told, like just killing people out in the open field tackling. And they just got groups of them. And they said, you're going to learn. You're going to remember how to wrap up and tackle in space. And we're going to be proficient at that on Saturday. And so we'll see. We'll see where that goes. As far as other things you think they needed to work on, Parker, what what, what other what other things do you think they need to work on going into this week? Because I think there's a lot. There is a lot. And I think the easy things to point to are, well, tackling, uh, being on the same page pre-snap so you don't have procedure penalties. <laughs> Um, and I feel like if you clean up those two things, right? If you take those two issues out of the game last week against Kansas State, boomer, is it a perfect game for Oklahoma? Not by any means, but do they win and probably win convincingly? Yeah, I would say so. Probably, yeah. Um, so I mean, there are little things here and there elsewhere that can afford to be cleaned up. Obviously, Dylan Gabriel will be the first to admit, and he was this past week, that he left some throws on the table. <laughs> he missed some that he'd like to have and the offense has to be better. And it starts with him, but you look at the, it, you look at the gaping wounds more so than anything else in the aftermath of a performance like that. And the gaping wounds were pre-snap penalties and poor tackling. And so you shore up those two things. You're going to be able to go down to Fort worth and win a football game against TCU because make no mistake, Brandon, the offense is going to cook tomorrow. They will. 
because TCU is not a strong defensive team and OU's offense has done plenty over the first four games to inspire confidence that if they get clicking early, they're going to hang a lot of points on the board. And that's what it really boils down to for them. That's kind of been the one bugaboo offensively is an inability over the last three games, especially to get rolling early. First game of the year, UTEP, they scored they had, they had three scoring drives within 15 offensive plays. So it wasn't an issue then, but real slow start against Kent State. Uh, not the slowest of starts against Nebraska, but uh, three and out on the first drive. And then, of course, against Kansas State, you spot them 14 points right off the bat, and you're playing from a hole. Oklahoma never led in that game. And so yeah, if you come out and go bombs away first couple drives and are able to put the ball in the end zone early, give yourself a lead as opposed to a deficit, uh, as opposed to a push coming out of the first quarter, then I think that really sets this offense and this team up for success uh, for the three quarters to come. So to me, those are the keys for Oklahoma. You shore up tackling, you shore up pre-snap penalties, and you get a play script that you feel really confident in and that you are that you believe you can come out of the gates with and is going to lead to points on your first drive and ideally your second drive as well. Because if you can score on your first two drives, you're going to you're typically going to break a team's will when you've got that OU on your helmet. It's yeah. different if you're the underdog. The underdog can score on their first two drives, and okay, maybe you're not batting an eye as much because you know that everything, or you believe that everything is going to balance itself out eventually. But when you're a team like Oklahoma, and you have as much talent and as much firepower on both sides of the ball as you do, if you jump out to a big early lead on a football team, it's a real easy way to make them quit. Mm. And it, I, I think when you look back at the K-State game, they start what they start out 14 nothing over Oklahoma. Yeah. Oklahoma ties it up at 14. Like, and you think the momentum start starting to turn in Oklahoma's favor, and then mistakes just start piling up. They were just killers as far as momentum went. And so I uh, I think you, you think this team is going to not do that two weeks in a row. At least you wouldn't think so. We've never seen them do it two weeks in a row, at least not since, what, 2014? So in almost a decade, eight years, it hasn't been done two weeks in a row. Can they fix all their problems now? Can they... Do what they need to do to stop Max Duggan from running. I think that is that I honestly I think that's the biggest key to this ball game. Max Duggan's legs. And I, I bet you I bet you I'll bet you a million dollars. Everybody sees a game plan. Now it's the game plan. I'm not saying they're going to execute it like they did at Nebraska, but I think this is the game plan they're going to do is against TCU is similar to what they did against Nebraska, and that is throw a bunch of extravagant looks and blitzes and all sorts of things coming from all different angles and, and a lot of shifts and a lot of mirage where they give them one look pre-snap, post-snap. It's completely different, those type of things. They didn't do that against K-State. They were pretty chalk. They blitzed, but they were pretty generic in their blitz packages because K-State's a big, burly team, and they reset the line better than anybody else in the Big 12. And when you go up against those type of – Oklahoma's not made to go up against those type defense, but they're just not. And I would venture to say neither is Alabama. When they play teams that are like that, they notoriously struggle just a little bit. They don't get back. They don't get the sacks that they normally do. Georgia doesn't get the sacks they normally do because those type of teams force you to be generic. They do. 
because they're not going to normally outscore you. So what they want to do is they want to hold the ball. They want to take the air out of everything and they want to just pound you and pound you and pound you and pound you until you get tired of being pounded and you start getting frustrated and make mistakes. Almost exactly what Oklahoma did. Or it is exactly what Oklahoma did. They made mistake after mistake after mistake. The last mistake was the biggest mistake of the whole game. And I'm not saying Deshaun, Deshaun White's a good player. But his mistake was just mind-boggling to me. Fourth and 16, you have a chance to win or at least go tie the game. They're not stopping you on defense. Your offense is going up and down the field on them right now. And you have been the whole second half. The only time it stopped you is when you stopped yourself with a stupid false start penalty to put you behind the chains and totally ruin the momentum and allow them to get set up, get their uh, defense put in the right position, get the get the personnel out there that they wanted out there because you were driving on them because you had the personnel advantage. Boom, 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 boom. False start, back. Now they're going to sub in. So you had all that going for you. It's a fourth and 16. They blitz, and the blitz was essentially a blitz. If you go back and watch it, essentially a blitz to fill every lane. They filled every lane to keep Adrian Martinez trapped. And to Martinez's credit, he was patient. He let people who over-pursued, over-pursued. He slid up into the pocket. He saw an opening. But here's the, here's the kicker to all that. If Deshaun White stays exactly where he's supposed to stay, 8 to 12 yards, his heels, 8 to 12 yards, he doesn't sink 25 like he did. He sinks 8 to 12, and that's it, because he lined up 8 yards from the line of scrimmage. Why did he do that? From the looks of it, I don't know for a fact, from the looks of it, He's supposed to be spying the quarterback. I don't, because I don't know the call, but he's the only free guy there. My my guess is because I've seen it time and time again during in football, is that they were like, if you're going to beat us deep, you're going to beat us deep, is probably what Venable said. And we deserve to lose the game. That's probably what he told them. Oklahoma deserved to lose the game. I was speaking as Brent Venables, and I'll just speak as me. Oklahoma deserved to lose the game if they got beat deep. That's fact. But here's the thing. They didn't get beat deep. As a matter of fact, everybody was covered up perfectly. The only thing that was left to do was to get the ball out of Martinez's hands or tackling. They didn't either. They sink back. The spy is 25 yards back instead of 8 to 12. If you're 8 to 12, you can get a good angle. You can at least slow him down and allow other pursuers to get there and stop him before he got to 16 yards. He'd done it all game. He's gained. He would gain 10, 12 yards or something like that on a run. He didn't gain like 20 or 30, maybe once the whole game, twice, if. But in that instance... Mm-mm. Bad news bears, bro. Bad news bears. And we all know what happened. Oklahoma loses the ball game. And that's not what lost the ball game, but that well, I think that was the biggest play of the ball game because it came in the biggest moment of the ball game. So it, it, that's easy to say. That's easy to point the finger at that that particular play. Yeah, and no, no game is won or lost on one play. No. But no. if you just get off the field on third and sixteen, get the crowd behind you, get an offense that's found its groove. In all likelihood, you're going down to tie the football game, and it's a way different yep. game at that point. So, uh, you like yeah, your odds in overtime, right? Exact, exactly. You love your odds in overtime, or maybe you go for two. Maybe you just say, "Let's win this thing right now." Um, regardless, if you want to isolate a single play and say this is the play that broke the camel's back, it's pretty obviously that play. But yeah, you know. It's it's not that simple. It never is. It never is. Yep. That's right. Um, what do you think the keys are to 
to stop TCU outside of Max Duggan. I think that's, that's the easy answer is you got to keep him from running because that's what he's best at. He's not the best passer in the world that he, he can kill you with his legs. He's a good yeah. passer. He's an adequate passer. He's just not going to make or break the game normally with his arm. Well, you got no more Zach Evans in that backfield. You got nobody that remotely resembles Deuce Vaughn. So, I don't know if you're too terribly worried about TCU gashing you on the ground as long as you contain Max Duggan. Uh, but as I wrote earlier this morning, it's worth remembering that when TCU came to Norman last year, Woody Washington was still sidelined with that groin injury. Mm-hmm. And Quentin Johnston was an absolute terror against yeah. whoever he lined up against. So, on this particular Saturday at Amon G. Carter Stadium, what you're doing is you're lining up your best corner opposite Quentin Johnson, and that's Woody Washington. You're letting Woody Washington have that assignment, and you're probably making sure you got a safety shading in his direction as well. Because if there's one single player that's going to beat you, I would argue it's not Max Duggan. I would say it's Quentin Johnston. At what, 240 yards receiving last year against Oklahoma, if my memory serves me correctly? So it, it's one of the most talented wide receivers in the Big 12. There's no two ways about it. He yeah. might be the best wide receiver in the Big 12. Now, Marvin Mims obviously has something to say about that. Uh, I think Oklahoma State's got a couple of guys who'd have something to say about that. But Quentin Johnson has a very compelling case of his own. So what you cannot do is allow that guy to torch you repeatedly the way that he did a season ago. And it didn't cost Oklahoma last year because the offense was scoring enough that uh, it really didn't matter in the end as far as the bottom line. But especially early in this football game, you cannot let a football player that's that talented start to really get rolling because you don't know where that's going to lead. And you also don't know what kind of a trickle down effect it's going to have uh, if you got to start accounting for him more and more throughout the game. And suddenly that opens up lanes that opens up space for guys on the other side of the football field and gives Max Duggan some easier options to hit in the short and intermediate game. So Quentin Johnston is the one guy that you have to make a concerted effort to take out of this football game and make no mistake. TCU is going to be trying to do the exact same thing with Marvin Mims. Both Oklahoma and TCU have one of the nation's finest receivers on their respective rosters. And for both defenses, it's going to be very critical that they account for those guys early in the football game and don't get beat by them. Yeah. Well, I I think, yeah, I I think Johnson's going to, I think that's the key. Cause I I remember him out of high school. He kind of came out of like, he was, he was, Known, but he was like this three star, big, tall, rangy, athletic guy. And then he had the senior season he had, and he like kind of exploded. And then Texas and Oklahoma and TCU and everybody started coming after him. Oklahoma kind of bailed out when they got their guys committed. But Texas and TCU went at it. And Malcolm Kelly, to his credit, pulled a shocker in getting him to TCU. And uh, it, it's worked out well for TCU having him on, on the roster. I'll tell you that that guy can play. He's going to be, I think he's a first or second round guy at some point when he decides he wants to go to the league. Uh, very, very talented, very fast, very strong, uh, tough to cover. Uh, I think that's the interesting part is how does Oklahoma, like, do you leave Woody Washington and Jaden Davis out on an Island? Does, um, I'm trying to think of somebody that's tall and rangy at corner that can, can I Walker? Does he, does he come in and play more? Can I Walker did see some more run last week. I mean, you have seen a lot of cornerback. The first guy that comes to mind is Joshua Eaton, but he got baptized by Quentin Johnson last year. Yeah. And I I think that he is probably not going to see the field very much this year, just from everything I'm hearing. Um, and I wouldn't be shocked to see him redshirt, honestly. I, I don't know that for a fact. I just know that that's when you don't play. And, like, he hasn't really even played when they brought in mop-up duty. So you would assume 
a red shirt might be on its way. I don't I don't know. Um but I think another guy that's long and rangy and that can cover that they they I literally talked to somebody this week and they think this kid has a chance to be downright special. They said he's a willing learner. He is one of the fastest guys on the team and arguably the fastest guy on the team. You already know where I'm going with this. Um he's long. He's about six foot one, long arms, long body frame, and is when it comes time to fourth quarter if Oklahoma's up, this is one of the first people they pull out there to play. Who am I talking about? Okay. Run me through this again. Arguably the fastest player on the team. Arguably the fastest player on the team. He's long. He's smart. He's a willing learner. And when fourth quarter rolls around, he's one in Oklahoma's up. He's one of the first DBs they pull off the bench to go play the whole fourth quarter. Didn't Gentry Williams. There you go. Yep. I talked to somebody this past week, multiple people actually this past week. And the excitement they have over him is to say giddy would be kind of an understatement. There's a lot of people that expect him literally. And I quote, if he amounts to what everybody think he's going to amount to, he can be one of the top three or four best DBs in the big 12 as a redshirt freshman or as a sophomore. That's pretty heady stuff. Pretty heady stuff. And it doesn't look like at this point he's going to redshirt because he's played in all four games. So That's exactly right. Yep. The second he touches the field again, redshirts off the table and he will touch the field again. No. Yeah. He's too good to keep off the field. That's the thing. And, um, He's been a he's been a surprise to a lot of people because of just how raw he was coming out of high school. And he's done really well. And he absolutely loves I know this for a fact, he loves Oklahoma. He loves playing there. Uh that's somebody that I've known for a long time. I know his family really well. So that that I think that's one of the cooler things is to see somebody like that because and there's talk that they think there's a lot of people that believe Woody's gonna come back. Like, that's the buzz right now. Like, he could come back next year. They like him. And if he doesn't come back, they like Kanai Walker being the other corner. Like, that's that's literally what you hear is Kanai and Gentry are kind of the, the fast risers at cornerback right now for Oklahoma. And when you see what they have coming in with the Jacoby Johnson and the Makari Vickers, you kind of like what's going on with, with the defensive back spot. Obviously, you have Eric McCarty at safety. You're still in, and we we can discuss this. before we get into the the last segment of recruiting real quick. What do you think the final score is going to be? I know you predicted it to be close on Tuesday. This is Friday morning. Talk to me, Parker. Have you changed gonna, your mind on? You're going to stick with it, huh? Well, I'm going to say exactly what I wrote this morning uh, in my pregame column, which is 45-28, Oklahoma. I think TCU puts up some points. I don't think it's enough to override the concerns I have defensively for the Horned Frogs, and I think Dylan Gabriel uh, is poised to silence a lot of the doubters this weekend. And there's been a lot of dissent surrounding the Sooners' southpaw quarterback of the course of the last week. I expect him to have a really strong, really clean, really efficient performance and for Oklahoma to win this game comfortably. So you said 45-21, is that what you said? 45-28. Um, I I don't even remember what I what did I say on Tuesday, dude? What was my score? Do you remember? I do not remember. I I know I gave 21 points or 17 or something like that. I want to say I, 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 it was like 41-17 or something like that, Oklahoma. And I still believe that. I still think this Oklahoma defense comes out. And if they don't, I'm going to be right on board with everybody else that's upset with it. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I'm – I was upset this past week. I was – yeah, I think everybody was upset watching that 
media and fans alike were upset, right? Like you, you never like seeing when you expect the defense to be a certain way and they play just unsound, unlike any Brent Venables defense that you're used to, right? And so I think that kind of hurt Oklahoma and the fan base. I think that hurt their confidence because they had PTSD. So I'm going to stick away from the PTSD and I'm going to stay strong in the confidence with Brent Venables and his defensive calling acumen because anybody that thinks that Ted Roof is over there calling all the plays, he's not. He's not. We both see Venables. Like, you and I both watch the sideline all game. Who's the one calling the plays in? It's Brent Venables. <laughs> it's Venables. It, but Ted Roof takes it, man. Like, he takes it from the media. Like, like he's the guy that made the calls. So, um, I, I think you're going to see more Jaron Canick, though. I believe that wholeheartedly. You're going to see more of him this week. And I think next year he's going to be the starting Will linebacker, and I think your starting uh, Cheetah is going to be Justin Harrington. And I think you're going to see a lot of Justin Harrington at safety this week. He's working very hard to understand the defense. I can tell you that by speaking to multiple people. The dude is in the film room constantly right now trying to make sure he understands his his position, which is safety now. He's not at Cheetah anymore. He's at safety. So if they can get him to – play at a high level and mentally at a high level, the sky is a limit for that kid because of how big and rangy he is. And they say, they think once it clicks, it's going to be phenomenal for him. So uh, he's got another year and everybody expects him to come back and be a dominant player next year, but they think he still has a chance to be pretty dominant this year. If he can do it, it'd be really great for Oklahoma to be able to have Billy Bowman and Justin Harrington at the safeties right now, because they're not key Lawrence and, they liked him on Harmon a lot. They think he has a chance to be special, but he still has a lot to learn as well. So we'll see. But I'm going to go 41-17 Oklahoma. I just think they rebound this week on both sides of the ball. And I think that Dylan Gabriel has a good game. I think that Marvin Mims has a good game. I think if I was going to pick a player of the game, I'm going to go Marvin Mims again. And defensive player of the game, I would probably go – I'm going to go Jalen Redmond. I'm going to go Jalen Redmond. I think he has a big game. Last time he played, every time he's played TCU, he's had a really good game. So I expect him to have another good game. Um, as far as recruiting goes, Parker, still on the board, Peyton Bowen still on the board, Ryan Yates at safety. You still have Oklahoma just talking with Jaden Greathouse, not so much, don't know where that stands. But they're in communication with the four star Notre Dame athlete commit who's wide receiver tight end type guy kind of an h-back build but just a great athlete overall um they're still in on samsung samsung okinola who they expect to take an official visit at some point this fall they still are in on i mean who, who else are they in on like caden mcdonald obviously johnny bowens who's visiting oregon this weekend um, to Celia Kana. They've got a lot of big names still on the board, Parker. And they've got 22 commits. And who knows what the David Hicks stuff, as we said earlier, that thing could come back around later on. We'll see. Um, talk to me. What, where's your feeling on recruiting? Where's your feeling on a couple of those guys I mentioned? I've got some information on a couple of them. But you go first. Yeah, well, obviously, I think – in light of what happened with DJ Hicks it makes it a lot more difficult to trust that OU ends up with Peyton Bowen. That's just kind of the obvious knee jerk reaction there because knowing that Texas A&M is the other team involved in the recruitment of yet another five star would lead you to believe that, well, if it happened once, but why couldn't it happen again? Yeah. So that kind of tempers the expectations there. I think Oklahoma is probably not going to end up with the number two class in the nation unless they get Peyton Bowen. There's still a path. If you get Bowen, but more than likely at this point, I would say you're looking at something in the four to seven, five to eight range. 
Uh, right now, there's a very clear divide between the top seven teams and the recruiting rankings and everybody else. And obviously, that'll change a little bit yeah, here and there. They're close between top seven, two to seven is like one or yeah. two, one and a half points or something like very that. Very close. So, mm -hmm. uh, I look, this is still going to be Oklahoma's highest rated class of the modern era. That hasn't changed. And it's still going to be a class that is much more dense with top 100 talents than any other class Oklahoma's side in the modern era. So all told, this is still a huge win for the Sooners in terms of recruiting. Would it have been really nice to have mm -hmm. DJ Hicks as the defensive capstone? Undeniably. And again, that's not the type of dude that you replace one for one in a recruiting class. But this class didn't tank with the loss of no. DJ Hicks. It's still a very... Very good class. And Oklahoma is going to end uh, that drought as far as signing a five-star defensive lineman because P.J. Adabare is a five-star defensive lineman. And that dude's not going anywhere. So uh, regardless of what happens down the stretch, I think you're really encouraged by the building blocks that OU has in this class right now. And the loss of Hicks hurts. It's going to hurt. It's going to sting for a while. But at the end of the day, you still got a lot of guys that have the opportunity to come in next year and be day one impact performers because the staff's done a tremendous job of both recruiting and evaluating. Yeah. I I, I think you're right. Like, and I'm I'm getting texts right now about DJ Higgs, by the way. So I don't know that this thing's over with completely, but I would assume that it's it's going to take some time. I think that's what fans need to understand. Even if he was to, you know, have his eye looking in that direction a little bit and one eye at A&M and one eye at Oklahoma, uh, it's going to take time for you to get to that point because this is all new. Okay. Everything's new. Everything's fresh right now. So you got to move on from that. As far as Peyton Bowen goes, I talked to somebody yesterday and the girlfriend thing may play much larger in this than even I even I expected. So, Girlfriends are still undefeated. Brandon. They are. They no. are. And it's not to say they won't take an L eventually, but they're still undefeated. That that they are. So, and if they are going to take an L eventually, why not Oklahoma, right? Why not after the David Hicks thing? Just rub salt in the wounds while we're at it, right? Um, I I I like I the Ryan Yates deal. I I know people want me to say yay or nay he's going to visit. I'll just say that there's a chance he visits later on. And we'll have to just see how everything plays out because he's got a lot of people in his ear. And when you're 17 years I'm going to be there tonight, by the way. We're recording this on Friday. I'm going down to Denton Geyer tonight. I'm going to see Denton Geyer. I'm going to see Jackson Ardell. I'm going to see Peyton Bowen. So I'll have a lot more information. They tend to tell me a lot of things because one, I don't report everything they tell me. Uh, and I have, I've yet to throw them under the bus as far as visits go. Like we've kept a lot of things under wraps that other people haven't. And so um, there's a trust there. So we'll, we'll have a better understanding of where things are with, with those guys, those that duo, the safety duo at Denton Greyer tonight um i think i i know oklahoma is going to be going down to see xavier uh philosami this week i wouldn't be shocked if oklahoma went and saw uh oh my gosh marquis Steele. i wouldn't be shocked if bates was there to see marquis Steele. i would imagine that if I am Miguel Chavis, I'm probably seeing uh, Nigel Smith this weekend. Just a guess. And then as far as receivers go, there's a lot of different receivers that Washington could be out seeing. Look, the whole staff is probably going to – the majority of the staff is going to be in the Fort Worth, Dallas, Fort Worth area making their presence known this week. And I expect we'll have a lot. I'll, 
we'll have more on OU Insider. Like I'll have where everybody's going to go and stuff like that later on in OU Insider uh, VIP and who they're going to see and yada, yada, yada. But I still think this class for 2023 ends up better than most think. I do. I I think that there's going to be a player, so Clemson-esque, by the way, and how Bates and everybody has always operated, that we don't know that they're in on right now and that they're recruiting hard. And there's going to be some random dude that shows up that's in the top 100 or top 50 that shows up, and these, at least this is my expectation just from history, from what I've seen Clemson do and how they've operated defensive recruiting over the years. That shows up like the last weekend before National Signing Day and before the dead period hits on an official visit to Norman, Oklahoma. And next thing you know, it's a barn burner, and Oklahoma's right there with whoever was leading the whole time. I, I'm going to bet it. And it could be David Hicks, for all we know, honestly, because he hasn't taken his official visit yet. He could, right before National Signing Day, could go, you know what? I'm going to go check out Oklahoma officially, and they'll have every freaking commit there that they can get there from Oklahoma and Texas and the surrounding and Kansas and the surrounding area there to make sure that he knows how much he's wanted if that happens. Now, I'm not trying to give you all hope. I'm not trying to give you all false expectations. I'm just telling you how this staff has operated in other places. And I expect them to operate similarly here at Oklahoma. Because if you get the Oklahoma brand next to the Clemson brand, the Oklahoma brand's still bigger. It's far bigger than Clemson. And I've had multiple staffers say, like, the logo transcends the nation comparison to other places. It's just one of those places that is just transcendent. And so that's why they've been able to come in and com even recruit at a higher level than they did at Clemson early on. It's the logo. And they know it. Everybody knows it. So let's see how this plays out, folks. Again, I'm like Parker. I'm going to go with the three between three and seven is probably where I think they end up. If they flip a few, I, I I don't think two is out of question. Just like Parker, I don't think it's out of question. But I think you've got to get Peyton Bowen. I think you've got to get another surprise in there for that to happen. And I think you've got to get Cecilia Connor. If you can pull Cecilia Connor and Peyton Bowen, I think your chances of being number two. And plus, we don't know how far a lot of these other commits are going to move up in the rankings. I think that's the other thing. Like we're not really putting into calculations yet because we don't know. We do know that there's another update coming on 24 seven in the middle of October. We expect Vasek, Jacoby Johnson, uh, Vickers, Caleb Spencer, probably even Jackson Arnold, PJ Atabari and uh, Caden, uh, Caden Green to probably move up. And and I would say almost Sego chance for him to move up as well. So they're far from done. Let's see how everything plays out. But I like this Oklahoma recruiting. It's the most balanced in the country as far as offense, defense, and having elite guys on both sides. And I think they're going to continue to recruit like that each and every year. And I think that's what's going to make this this staff different than any other staff. They're not going to be heavy one year with offense heavy next year with defense. It's going to be balanced each and every year, and that's going to be the difference. All right, Parker, you got it. Final score again once again for TCU? 45-28, Oklahoma. You have any last words before we get out here in this podcast? I have no last words. Let's hope Oklahoma wins this game on Saturday because if not, our lives may be hell for several hell. days and or weeks to follow. I would have uh, yeah, excited to make the trip down to Fort Worth. <laughs> TCU is a fun little place to watch slash cover a football game. So looking it is. forward to it. it. You know what? That that campus is uh undervalued on its how pretty it is. It's a gorgeous campus. The area is so pretty. Like people, the the hills around the west side of downtown Fort Worth is gorgeous. It really it just is. It's beautiful out there. It's old kind of Victorian homes, just pretty everywhere. So, yeah, uh, I'll go 41-17. 
I like Oklahoma's chances to up the ante compared to last week. I think TCU fits their personnel as far as what Oklahoma can do to TCU defensively and offensively. So we'll see how this plays out. Again, Parker and I like Oklahoma. And uh, Parker, where will you be before we go? Where will you be tonight? I'm going to head down to Eagle Stadium in Allen to -hmm. watch four-star quarterback Michael Hawkins, four-star edge rusher Zena Amozola, and five-star tight end Devon Mitchell, as well as a guy that Oklahoma fans should know, a name they should know if they don't already, uh, at quarterback in the 2025 cycle, Kevin Sperry of Rock Hill. So my guy watching all those guys tonight. I'm jealous you're actually going to watch Sperry. That's my dude. For people that don't know, he and his brother are the older guys in the C4 7-on-7 program, and my son is the – youngest quarterback in the seven on seven program. So we're around him all the time. The family is fantastic. The dad played against Oklahoma. Little known fact, the dad played against Oklahoma in the 2002 Rose bowl at Washington state. He was a linebacker for Washington state at that time. He actually sent me a photo uh, of him tackling. I think it was Quentin Griffin, maybe, uh, or Antonio Perkins on a punt return. I can't remember which one it was, but I have it on my phone. I should pull it up and show you all the people on YouTube. But yeah, he he was a good athlete. Comes from good stock, and the kid both the both both Kevin and Rezzy, Rezzy's the youngest, are phenomenal athletes and phenomenal quarterbacks. And I think Oklahoma's going to end up offering Kevin. And if they do offer Kevin, I like Oklahoma's odds. I'll just put it like that. So. um yeah, that's that should be fun for you, Parker. A lot of fun. Congrats on that one. I'm I'm kind of jealous because I'm going to watch a just a going to be a ball beating tonight. <laughs> Dent guy is going to kill freaking McKinney Boyd. Anyways, all right, that's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider under the Visor Sooners po- podcast, not the post game, but the podcast. If you're not a member of OUinsider.com, we have all the goods for you. Like we kept everybody like before they even announced to Texas A&M, we were telling our our board it's A&M. So they knew it 20 minutes before the announcement even happened. That doesn't mean that we knew the whole time because obviously we didn't. We were just as stunned as everybody else. But we try to keep you all abreast of everything that's going on with recruiting and team news each and every week. And that's what Parker and I do. We have Joey, our editor, that also does all the quotes. Like, this dude transcribes by himself, folks. He's a menace on that keyboard. He's the fastest typer I've ever seen in my life. Would you think that? Do you think that too, Parker? The fastest typer you've ever seen? He types ridiculously fast. Yes. <laughs> it's insane. So, uh, yeah, you got, we have Joey Helmer typing up and doing all the, the stories, the aggregate stories that you all see on Facebook. That's him. That's Mr. Helmer. He brings you all to the site, lures you in, and then you all look at the VIP stuff. You get intrigued. You're like, oh, $1 doesn't seem all that much. Then $9.95 afterwards, that's nothing. That's right. You won't even notice that's out of your pocket. Or you can drop right now 30% off. $75 gets you one year of OU Insider and all of 24-7 sports. That means VIP for Texas A&M, VIP for Texas, Oklahoma State, USC, Alabama, All the people that Oklahoma goes up against in Big 12, all the people that go up against in recruiting, you can go check out and see what their side's saying on things and not just listen to me and Parker. And that's just for $75. And then after that first year, you stay with us for one year, you get Paramount Plus on top of being a member of OU Insider. So that's a two-for-one value. You don't get it to start out. You stay with us for a year. You get Paramount Plus, which Paramount Plus is – one of the best streaming services there are. I watch stream a lot of their shows like the offer, um, the Jeremy Renner gel gel show, like a never King of something. I can't remember. Um, they obviously have 1883. They've got 1932 coming out. Another Yellowstone prequel. Uh, they they've got, uh, Tulsa Kings coming out with Stallone was recorded in Oklahoma city and Tulsa majority of it. Ironically, it's called Tulsa King, but they recorded it in Oklahoma City. I don't know what to tell you all. The majority of it, that's just what they did. But still, it was recorded in Oklahoma, and that's pretty cool. 
So all of that's going on. And uh, we would love to have you guys there to be able to not just get OU Insider, but Paramount Plus after you stay with us for a year. So, hey, check us out. Parker and I are on there answering your questions each and every day. We're growing faster than we've ever grown. We literally got something the other day, Parker, yesterday, right? Yesterday, where it said we were number one in 24-7 in year-to-year growth. We want to thank you guys so much for that. Honestly, we are blessed to be able to do that. That's freaking amazing. Uh, didn't ever expect that to happen. And you guys made it happen as Oklahoma fans. And we don't do that without you all. So thank you guys so much. We hope to see you guys on there. We've got a lot of information coming this weekend. We've got a lot of recruiting stuff coming. We've got a lot of team stuff coming. Uh, and we hope to see you guys on there for the foreseeable future. So, all right, that's going to do it for Parker Thune. My name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day. We will see you guys on the post-game podcast.